From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Who is Hugo Chavez? Some believe he is the enemy. He's more dangerous than bin Laden, and the effects of Chavez, his war against America, could eclipse those of 9-11. Some believe he is the answer. I am with you, Chavez. Hello, President. But no matter what you believe, in South America, he is just the beginning. South of the border. Today, we spend the hour with acclaimed Hollywood filmmaker Oliver Stone. His latest film is a road trip through South America. He talks to seven presidents and ex-presidents about the revolution sweeping through the continent. We'll speak with the Academy Award-winning director Oliver Stone and historian, writer, activist Tarek Ali. He co-wrote the screenplay for South of the Border. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, we spend the hour south of the border on the political changes that are sweeping across South America. Academy Award-winning filmmaker Oliver Stone has taken on three American presidents in JFK, Nixon and W. A Vietnam War veteran, he was decorated with a Bronze Star and a Purple Heart. As a filmmaker, he's tackled the most controversial aspects of the war in his classic Splatoon and Born on the Fourth of July. He looked at the greed of the financial industry in the, Wall St in the Hollywood hit, Wall Street, and the sequel, Wall Street 2, Money Never Sleeps, premiered at the Cannes Film Festival last month. Well, now the acclaimed director of films like Salvador, Comandante, and Looking for Fidel returns to Latin America. In his latest film, releasing this week in the United States, Oliver Stone takes a road trip across South America, meeting with seven presidents from the United continent. United States this week. Award-winning director Oliver Stone joins us here in New York, and we're joined by the acclaimed writer and activist Tarek Ali. He co-wrote the screenplay for South of the Border with Mark Weisbrot. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Oliver Stone, welcome for the first time to Democracy Now! It's good <laughs> to have you, you here. Uh, talk about why you chose to make this film. It shows me. I, uh, I do feature films uh, most of the time, but I do—I've done six documentaries and work. This is my fourth one. And I've been going down to South America off and on for 20 years. I did Salvador there in 1985 with uh, about the Central America situation. I was shocked what I saw. I'd, just back, I'd been back from Vietnam for about— uh, uh, for 15 years at that point, and I saw all these American soldiers down in uh, Honduras and, uh, you know, fighting against the the, uh, the Nicaraguan government. I saw them in Salvador, and I saw them in a uh, form of them in Costa Rica. I was shocked. And uh, from that thing, I went back and saw Chiapas. I saw Commander Marcos. I rode with him a bit in the jungle. And then I went down there to uh, Cuba. I had a problems with Cuba because uh, my films were censored here. They were not shown. One of them was not shown. Commandante was taken off the air. It was shown in Europe. And then, uh, so, uh, I, uh, Chavez, it was not shown on HBO. It was pulled from HBO. It was promoted, and then it was taken off the air two weeks before. Why? Because that was after, no, it was after that sort of that mindset of post 9-11, you know. There was a lot of hysteria in the air, and Castro had just uh, arrested hijackers. There had been a, a, a confrontation with Bush. So HBO kindly told me, you know, we'd like you to complete the film and go back and ask him some other questions. I said, no, this is my film. This is the way it's finished. I'll go back and I do another film called Looking for Fidel, which we ended up doing. So I asked him a lot of hard questions on Looking for Fidel, which was aired. But never, they never aired the uh, the. Be it's, it's a heartbreaking story for me personally as a filmmaker because I really put a lot of effort into it. It's a 90-minute film. It's played all over the world except here. So Chavez was a sort of a natural because he was such a, a demonized, polarizing figure. But when I met him, it was not at all what I thought. You know what, what we made him out to be. So I went on from talking to Hugo. He suggested, you know, go talk to other people in the region. You know, don't believe me necessarily. So we went around and we talked to. Seven other, pre eight other presidents, or seven other presidents in six countries, and we got this amazing unity in referendum, saying like, "Hey, these guys are changing the way Latin America is." And we don't know this story in America when you think about it, ex except Peru and uh, Mexico. Well, Peru and uh, Colombia really are the two American allies in the region. So what struck me as a news, as, a, as something that's historic, is that I've never seen these countries in South America, in a sense, unified by an idea of reform at the same time. Because in the past, when Chile or Argentina or Brazil happened, we picked off the reformers one at a time, because they only happened at, they didn't happen in a unity. And this is the first time I've seen that since, what, since Bolivar, maybe? <laughs> we haven't, you know, going back to the 1820s. 
work well, so hard. I mean, he really cares. So do all of them, by the way. Every single one of them I met was elected duly, democratically, which Americans don't know, and they serve the people, unlike a lot of the oligarchs and uh, dictators who ruled prior and we supported. We, but we're against these people. That's what amazes me. Why is our, why, what is it about America that makes and en needs enemies and makes enemies out of these people who are reformers in their country, whether it's Allende or uh, or uh, the, the people in Argentina or Brazil or uh, Torrios in Panama or it, the list is long. You know, why? Nicaragua. <laughs> You also center in on the IMF and the role of the IMF, which, again, most Americans know little about the operations of the IMF around the world. Yet, yeah, in most other countries in the world, the IMF is yeah. well known. Uh, Mark Weisbrot was with the Center of Economic Policy and Research, and he's a co-founder of that, and he brought that element into this. It's very important, and uh, obviously Americans don't care about economics as much. It's hard to follow. But the, Mark points out that in the 1990s, it was a, there was about $20 billion in loans from the IMF to Latin America. Now there's about a billion, which is interesting. They, they got rid of it. And Kirchner, uh, Nestor Kirchner of Argentina is a real hero here. He did technically uh, default on the IMF, but then he paid them off. And he defaulted on the corporate bonds, which is a big scandal. But yet Argentina economy, which was predicted to be a disaster, improved radically. So did uh, Chavez's economy for six years. It went crazy. I think the gross national product uh, went 90 percent up, up 90 percent. Poverty was cut in half. So all these changes in all these countries have been positive since the IMF is out. They don't want our money. They don't want the loans. It's important. We're going to go right now to a clip of Hugo Chavez uh, talking about oil. Chavez's reforms provoked fierce resistance from the country's oligarchy. We have a government that lies. They're all a bunch of liars. They controlled the Venezuelan media and used it to foment opposition. They also mobilized support within the military and received help from the United States and Spain. I think the most reasonable thing for the president and his cabinet to do is resign voluntarily or disappear from the country. A businessman. Pedro Carmona was chosen to be the new president. He supposedly flew to Madrid to be measured for a presidential sash. The coup against Chavez had one motive, oil. Bush made a plan. First, Chavez, oil. Second, Saddam, Iraq. The reason behind the coup in Venezuela and the invasion of Iraq is the same. Oil. <coughs> that was Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. Oliver Stone, um, talk about how the U.S. media portrays Chavez. Well, you always do is go to YouTube and you'll see. I mean, we put it in the movie. It's just, it's hysterical and outrageous. And by the way, mainstream Washington Post, New York Times, it's awful. I mean, it's almost as if the New York Times guy, Simon Romero is his name, he sits there for years and he's a sniper. He doesn't say one positive thing. It's like every week or two he has to file his story, make it negative. It seems like that's a directive. And he goes out and you, I mean, you read this stuff. It's all of it. And he never goes to the other side. He never gets to the other side of the story. And he has very complex little incidents and he, and he builds it up into this madhouse of, it seems like it's Chile again, like Allende. It's like the economy is crashing and this, the contrary is true. I mean, he's a, it's a very rich country. It's a regional power. It's got apparently $500 billion, 500 billion, 5,000 5, billion barrels of oil in reserve. It's a major player for the rest of our time on Earth, as long as we go with oil. You know, they're not going to go away. So Brazil and Venezuela, and that raises a whole interesting thing about what recently happened in Iran, you know, when Lula from Brazil went over there with Turkey, uh, Erdogan. That was a very interesting moment for me and for Tariq, because I grew up in the 50s, so did he, and we, you know, we remember the neutral bloc, remember the, we remember uh, Nehru and, and Nasser and Sukarno and, and, and uh, a uh, uh, fellow in Cambodia, uh, Sihanouk. Sihanouk. I mean, you, there was a block of people who used to say, hey, this is what we want, this is not what the United States wants, and they were a, a mediator, the third, a third rail between the Soviets and us. That's gone in the world, and people don't seem to realize it who are growing up. So when Lula did that, I couldn't believe the outrage by people.